delighted to be hearing now from Hilke Komulainen, uh, who is Head of Responsible Investment at Aegon, and David Heyman, who is the Campaign Director at Make My Money Matter that Maria just mentioned a few moments ago. Uh, we are going to be talking now about some fascinating new research uh, that looks at the growing numbers of clients who are engaging with the net zero transition and the need to invest responsibly. So to kick this session off, uh, Hilke is going to uh, refer to some slides on the Aegon's latest research, give us that update, and then we'll move over to some questions. So please do keep your questions and comments coming in. Uh, and now the virtual floor is yours, Hilke. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, as mentioned, my name is Hilke Kumulainen, heading up the responsible investment work at Aegon. And I'm here to talk to you about how two very important topics link together, that is financial well-being and responsible investment. Um, this is based on a survey that we've done on 10,000 UK residents, so essentially trying to bring a little glimpse of the voice of the customer into this. Um, and the findings that from our survey are relatively interesting, if you wouldn't mind moving on to the next slide. Now, before I get into um, the findings themselves, a little bit about Aegon, the reason that I'm speaking here today is like for all other attendees at this uh, at this event, climate change is increasingly a significant concern for us. Um, us as a business, we've been in the responsible investment space for decades. Um, Aegon Asset Management, our asset management uh, arm, has been managing funds to ESG mandates for over 30 years, but more recently, really focusing on what climate change means for us as a business. We've set our net zero targets, um, uh, net zero by 2050, halving emissions by 2030. Um, and we recognize that there's a huge program of work required to get there. Um, we have made a start. Um, 12 billion is the amount today that we have so far moved into uh, ESG screened and optimized strategies across our workplace defaults um, and across our entire platform. There's over uh, 19 billion invested into, into ESG strategies, but the work continues. Now onto the topic of the day. So just a quick reminder of some of the some of the backdrop and the factors that are driving growth in, in responsible investments. We will find that this is also relevant for, um, for the findings of our survey. On the next slide, please. Um, we've got the net zero transition. We know that um, even though we've made significant progress to COP26, there's a lot of positive momentum. We're yet to shift onto the necessary Paris aligned pathway, and we're on course to significantly blow the carbon budget. The regulators see it. They are looking to accelerate change, and climate change regulation is something that has been impacting large pension schemes like us for over a year, um, and we expect to see a lot more of this. Um, that's at the same time while the industry does recognize that climate risk, ESG risk is just uh, an investment risk among others, um, a real uh, changing view as to how to think about sustainability and sustainable risks in the context of investment. And finally, and perhaps most interestingly uh, for, the, for the purpose of today's topic is that the clients are also getting interested in this. Um, 16 billion is the total of flows into responsible investment funds in the UK in last year, and which has increased by 37% from the previous previous year. Now on the next slide, please. Um, finance, what do we mean by financial well-being? Um, this is a real core, core topic for us at Aegon, um, and it's all about how people feel about the control they have over their financial future, the relationship with their money. Um, focusing on the things that make life enjoyable and meaningful, and crucially, that focus on not just right now, but what does your financial future look like in retirement? Um, and why is this important? Really, it's all about that platform to better engage with team members. Um, and I think you'll probably agree that there's been a mindset change over the last couple of years, somewhat accelerated by COVID, when people are really considering what matters to them most in life and move towards thinking about quality of life, prioritization, time and freedom um, to do uh, what matters most. And what is it that will enable people to make this transition? There's a financial element to this as well, freedom to achieve these goals. It is a positive relationship with their finances. Now, more than ever, on the next slide, please. Um, we are being exposed to and being made aware of the of different environmental, social, and governance issues and how those are impacting uh, impacting the world from climate change through to uh, inequality um, and corporate governance. And the UK public echo that um, seventy two percent say that they're concerned about 
global warming and other environmental issues. Um, but it's not just the environment, even though that might kind of lead the charge of the agenda, um, but also inequality and corporate governance that are important. And I think it's fair to say that how our behavior affects others, how it affects the planet, is now firmly front of mind and the majority of people do want to help. They want to make a difference. Now, how does that link to their savings? Well, on the next slide, most people do undertake a number of different day-to-day -day activities that they um, to support a sustainable society. 80% say that they recycle. 47% say, well, they avoid single-use plastics. Only 9%, by contrast, those 9% uh, of those surveys are investing their savings um, in funds with sustainability criteria built in. Um, and um, interestingly, that does slightly go up uh, with advised clients, uh, up to uh, 22%. Um, but nevertheless, given that um, in, in investments and, and pensions obviously can have an impact on companies, does, does link to the transition to net zero and a low carbon, carbon economy, it is a little bit worrying to see it so low on the list. At the same time, these figures echo something that we broadly recognize from our body of research, um, and something that's well recognized by behavioral scientists, namely, people often struggle to engage with less tangible, more long term activities such as their savings than they do with the much more near term tangible activities such as just day to day, day to day spending, even if the impact of the long term activity is much greater than of the short term activity. Next slide, please. In addition, we, when we ask people directly about their investment plans, we, that we find a mismatch between how people intend to invest and how they actually invest. Our research showed that 50%, 7% believe they should be invested in, in funds with sustainability criteria embedded to some degree. In reality, only 30% say they are. It's a high proportion of don't know answers, 50% in terms of the actual savings, which suggests a lack of investment confidence and or a lack of engagement with their, with their savings. And both of these do need addressing. On the next slide, please. Another really interesting finding, uh, and as you can see here, among those people who hold sustainable investments or uh, investments with, the, with sustainability criteria embedded, um, the more money they have invested this way, the more likely they uh, are to state they feel savings, happiness, and purpose. So, for instance, um, a kind of the left hand, uh, hand side of the of the graph, 51% of those with 10% invested in sustainable investments will feel joy. 53% of those with 10% invested in sustainable investments will, will feel purpose, compared to that number going up to 77% if all of their investments are, um, are invested with sustainability criteria. And of course, it does make sense that those who invest more heavily in sustainable investments are likely to val value this more. But there's real, stre real strength of this trajectory that suggests there is a correlation between that kind of feeling of, of, of joy and purpose related to savings, which are, in our research, key contributors to financial well-being and investing responsibly, which does make it an area worth exploring. Um, obviously, there are some barriers to... For, for savers to consider responsible investment as well, which is what I'm going to uh, address next on the next slide, please. There we go. Um, unsurprisingly, some of those barriers, key barriers are terminology and return expectations. And um, I'm sure many people will agree that the sustainable responsible investment world is full of alphabet soup, starting from ESG through to SDGs, through to TCFD, through to SDR, SFDR, et cetera, which can make it unfamiliar and inaccessible to the wider public. And we as an industry do not have con uh, consensus on the meaning of these terms, which leaves opportunity for confusion and for greenwashing, which we'll come to a little bit later. Um, and similarly on return expectations, as an industry, I, we, we, I spoke a little bit about ESG risk just being investment risk. But we're kind of coming to the consensus that considering things like climate risk um, and net zero is just sound management of uh, of investments for for the long term, but um, at the same time, uh, for 
kind of your average consumer, it's understandable that there are people who assume that if you're investing sustainably or doing the right thing or in, investing according to your edX, that might come at a cost to cost to returns. Um, on the next slide, please. How do we frame the conversation going forward? We know that there's a large gap, which can also become an engagement opportunity um, between it, people's intentions and their choices. And um, I want to spend the rest of the presentation addressing some of these challenges and exploring how they could be overcome. Um, if we think back a few slides, it showed that 50% of people surveyed uh, didn't know if they had exposure to investments that considered sustainability criteria. Um, most likely quite a few big proportion of those will be invested in a pension default fund. Um, they may just mind us not know exactly what their savings are investing. So the gap might not be quite as big, might be more about increasing um, awareness. Some of the things in building that awareness is considering sustainability from the very beginning, not waiting for people to ask about it, not making it an and on, but making it clear and accessible. Similarly, um, explaining the default funds ESG approach, the majority of, um, uh, of savers will be, of members will be invested there, and also providing education. Um, it's a fast evolving field, the alphabet soup is there, um, not assuming level of knowledge, um, but in somehow framing the conversation, uh, making sure that savers actually understand that responsible investment isn't even an option at all, um, and then moving, moving from there to thinking about if it's right for them. On the next slide, please. Um, when it comes to education, it's quite easy to, um, to go down a rabbit warren. There's so much information and detail frameworks around there. Um, in order to avoid that, two core messages. Firstly, um, there is an element of sustain uh, investment being a powerful tool in effective posi infecting positive change. Um, investments do have an opportunity to have a um, to to impact the world around us. Um, but we also know that savers can struggle to visualize some of these long term abstract ideas such as pension savings. Um, so it makes sense to start more with okay, how do people feel and act today, such as do you know that your savings can um, support your beliefs? Um, rather than going down the, okay, let me tell you how responsible investing works, and then building on that um, connection, uh, providing clear and, uh, and accessible education to strengthen that. The second message on the next slide is really about linking ESG risk management um, through to investments and, and returns. Because um, typically members, you know, members of the public, um, clients uh, of, of pension schemes will be very well aware of some of the factors uh, impacting portfolios, such as such as climate change, even the pandemic, but that association back to their savings might be missing. And here's some quite interesting, just a fairly simple example using modeling done by Mercer from a couple of years ago, which shows that even if we manage to keep global warming well below two degrees, that will have an impact um, on um, uh, on the return expectations of uh, of different types of sources of energy, um, if we do manage to uh, man manage a career and tra transition to a low carbon economy, uh, clear growth uh, projected by Mercer in renewable energy, uh, whereas deterioration in the value of fossil fossil fuels um, as part of that transition, which then helps bring uh, this to life for investors, which brings me on to the next slide. Um, Bringing ESG targets to life um, could be a top in presentation topic in its own right. So I'm going to very briefly summarize a few key considerations. And a really big part of this is illustrations, which are oh so tempting. They seem so uh, so nice to say, well, you know, ten thousand dollar pounds investors could reduce exposure to CO2 emissions by five tons, which is equivalent to a car driving. 12,500 miles, which means that your savings have taken 12,500 miles worth of CO2 emissions out of the atmosphere. Um, this, however, needs to be accurate. 
most often when you're um, talking about pensions in particular, this really looks at uh, decreasing emissions relative to a benchmark compared to, you know, if you'd hadn't tilted or if you uh, hadn't taken a, um, a slightly different uh, portfolio construction decision. But that ne is not necessarily the same thing as taking emissions out uh, of the real world as reducing emissions globally. So while illustrations can help uh, bring investments to life, there's a very thin line where it's overstating um, and going right above the, uh, the impact of investment. Um, greenwashing is not uncommon. The other piece relating to real world actions is, um, you know, what you can do is can clearly explain the sustainability credentials of the fund, if it has exclusion of what types of companies those are, if it has an engagement focus, um, how many companies the fund manager we with, what were the outcomes, um, and bringing that to life through case studies to help people visualize how their investments are helping. And then using consistent data data points, be those third party ESG scores that look at le the resilience of companies to long term ESG factors or perhaps carbon metrics like carbon intensity. Um, so really focusing on kind of focusing on the facts and treading carefully when it comes to illustrations and overstating. On the next slide, um, there is a kind of going coming back to that point about language. It is really the alphabet soup about of um, of, the, uh, of sustainability and the responsible investment world. As an industry, we have failed to form a coherent language. Um, we know that the regulators are stepping in, so it's a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel, but there is a consensus, I think, that we need to do better. And certainly at AGOD, we are trying to help this process with clear communications across different formats, whether that you are an advisor or an employer. And um, if you are, then you should work with your providers to make sure everything is as clear um, as, and factual as can be. The final piece to kind of uh, to the to the puzzle on the next slide um, really is then the uh, proposition um, choice, making sure that there's an adequate range of sustainable investment solutions out there to help people um, invest in line with uh, uh, their beliefs and convictions. And um, while the biggest group of members uh, in default funds has been typically usually quite happy to um, uh, let their employer or provider uh, choose to provide the most robust default option, there is, we're starting to see pressure on default funds as well to consider sustainability. We're seeing passive screened options. We're seeing net zero targets across workplace defaults as we have set ourselves. Um, and um, and a number of uh, tilted or sc uh, and screened strategies come into come into place. Um, just as an illustration of this, um, this chart shows the progress and the growth phases of our of our life path pension default, which over two years we've transitioned eighty percent of assets into ESG ESG strategies, mainly global equities and corporate bond, bonds, primarily passive, um, which is. Um, a part of the total of 12 billion that we have transitioned um, into ESG strategies across our defaults. The challenge will come when it comes to the remaining 20%. Um, there's been a lot of focus on uh, sustainable uh, products in equities. Um, in some of the other asset classes, there's lots of innovation happening. We ourselves partner with the Global Ethical Finance Initiative and Aegon Asset Management um, just uh, last year um, to develop a sustainable sovereign bond fund. So to think more about how we can bring this into into other other asset classes, but things like price caps and the in the pension space may um, provide it, make it harder in um, certain uh, certain asset classes to think more about that positive positive impact. But I think it's generally fair to say that pension funds are still quite early on in the journey to net zero. There's quite a lot of progress already being made and will continue to be made. Our research, just to kind of reiterate, does show that half of uh, respondents don't know where their investments invested. Um, so given these change, ESG changes to default funds, it's really a good time to raise awareness. Um, and our research suggests that this could improve scheme engagement. I'm going to pause there because I think we'll have some very interesting th things to hear from David as well. Thank you very much. Uh, for, for such a wide-ranging presentation, so much to pick out there. David, just going to come to you um, and um, yeah, for, for your thoughts on make my money matters views on um, yeah on this space and 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 some of the findings there that Hilke pointed out about this disconnect that does continue to dog the market despite people with good intentions. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks, James, and thanks, Hilke. I mean, I, I think 
So I'm, I'm David Heyman. I'm the campaign director at Make My Money Matter. And we're a campaign set up to address many of the issues which have been mentioned today, um, provide savers with more voice and choice over where their pensions are going and to mobilize those voices to drive change within the industry, to push and to challenge and to advance lots of the progress that's already happening, but that we think needs to happen much quicker if, we, if we're gonna address the climate targets that, that have been mentioned already today. And I think before, maybe before I, I tell a little bit more about how we work, I think we've heard a lot about the theory of what um, pension savers in the UK um, would like from their money or consider from their money. But we've got a short film, which I think tells the story in a really nice way and gives the human touch when people actually engage with their pensions, what it could be doing right now and, and what kind of world it could build in the future. So if it's all right, we'll just show that for 90 seconds or so. And I think it brings this issue to life quite well. Absolutely. Let's, uh, let's get that uh, VT running. It actually never occurred to me before that my pension could be something that would create change. So that's the dream, yeah. Tell me about it. <laughs> I would wonder why I hadn't been told about it already. It doesn't sound like it can or, or should work. I think most people don't know what their pension's investing in. It would be good to know more about the companies that my pension is being invested in, whether they're doing good in the world. Who are they? Who are they run by? What are they doing? Where are they? What? Invest in these. You're reading this like a list of horror. Making weapons and ammunition, it's a no-go. Cigarette companies, coal mines, oil companies, gambling, no way. I feel like something better could be done and done with my money. Oh, there you go. That is a stunning list of good things. If my pension went to these things, that would be a wonderful, wonderful thing. Social housing, infrastructure like schools and hospital. I would definitely want my money to be invested in building wind farms, tackling climate change, and companies that treat their work as well. This is my kind of list. And I, as a kind of customer, can feel, first of all, better about where my money is going, but also you would assume that those pensions would do actually quite well, probably make more money, ultimately. It would make me feel, feel better in some, some small way that the things that I believe in, the things that I am I think are important and are important to me are being reflected in how my money is being used. I would probably go so far as to say I would increase my pension contributions. Yeah, I'm going to go make some calls when I leave here. Now I'm going to run back home and check. Understanding that the money could be working and obviously working to contribute to a better world. That's pretty amazing. people's everyday actions, their beliefs, their values, um, and what their money may be invested in. And that's part of what we're trying to do as a campaign, to tell this story that, that our money isn't a static, scary, inert thing separate from your everyday actions. It's actually one of the key steps you can take to contribute to building a better world around you. I think the second point is highlighting how exciting and empowering it can be when people feel like they have more ownership, more control, more visibility over their money and the world it's building. And again, that's another factor that we really try and emphasize that as much as there may be some challenges and contradictions in what your money is currently invested in, there's a much better future that we can all build together if that money is directed more positively. And thirdly, again, I think something Hilika mentioned is that when people are empowered and engaged and realize the power of their money, they actually want to save more into their pensions. And study after study shows that if people feel their money is doing good in the world, they're more likely to contribute further to their pensions. So it's the kind of financial well-being point as well as the actually building a world fit for retirement. So our campaign is all about telling the story to the members of the public, empowering them to, to have more voice and choice over where their money goes, getting businesses, NGOs, organizations on side to align their company value, their company pension schemes with their organizational values, and using that pressure, that momentum, and that awareness to go to the pensions industry and say, look, your customers care about this, your clients are demanding better, the mood music is changing about how our money is invested on our behalf and what it can be doing, and mobilizing that world to kind of um, improve investments at a macro level, not creating a nice, lovely ESG or sustainable fund over here, as good as that will be, but really changing how the default of the three trillion pounds invested in UK pensions is invested.
Absolutely. It's, um, it's such a fascinating space, isn't it? I mean, what, what do you think is at the root of this disconnect? Because, you know, that video highlights it so nicely that once people know, they're like, oh, hang on, that seems wrong. But then it's still difficult to take that next step of actually engaging with your pension fund. It's something everyone puts off. People are busy. It's, you know, it's, it's just an area that is so hard to get people to follow their intentions into those actions as your, as your chart and your survey showed, uh, Hilke. Um, you know, come to you first, Hilke. I mean, what, what do you think is at the root of this? I think there's a, I mean, that video also really kind of, um, I suppose, supports the findings that we've, uh, that, that we've had from, through our own research and that just lack of understanding of, you know, kind of how it all links together. And I have to say, like, financial services have not made it easy for people to necessarily understand how it all works and that just that general realization of the fact that you know in, you know if we're if we're working we'll, ha we'll have a pension and that pension will be invested somewhere and that link back together and i guess that point that came up in our research as well when it is less tangible you can't be like well here's a you know me taking the recycling out or making a choice between buying i don't know plant-based milk or um uh, or cow's milk or, or whatever it's less tangible usually it's something that happens automatically it comes out of your comes out of your bank account and it happens in the future so that piece about kind of short-term reward versus versus long-term gain um which is something that is recognized by behavioral science as well hmm. and david, something think, that's harder to engage with indeed and, and david do you think just like raising awareness as you're doing can help tackle that or are there other steps other reforms that are needed to make this easier for people beyond just that that awareness raising part that, you, that you're doing yeah for sure and I, I think there's a foundational point which is around awareness um and that's both at a kind of emotional level and the point about investing for the future feeling a long time term often easy to to divorce or distance yourself from that um, and then there's the kind of financial literacy point on the other hand, which again is a problem we've got across our country in, in many different ways, which means that there's the, a low base awareness and engagement on your pension. I think we can all agree on that, but that's certainly not the only problem there. There are certainly practical solutions which need to be implemented by the, the industry, which I think will help. And that includes better communication around where our money is going, and not just the businesses it's going, but the impacts of those investments, the impact of those businesses are having on the world around them. So there's a communications point, there's a transparency point providing that data. And then there's a availability of products and services, because I think even if everyone turned around tomorrow and said, I realize the power of my money, I'm highly mobilized, I'm engaged, I want to make my money matter. What do you do? Yeah, there aren't a, there are, there are options and there are better options coming on the market every day. And pension funds are addressing these issues, but there aren't a kind of plethora of perfectly suited, adaptive products and services that, that are readily available for everyone to tailor their money. And I think what we're trying to do is show that there is demand for those products, there is demand for those mm. services, and that there is opportunities there. And the more you can create that demand and, and mobilize the savers around these issues, the quicker the industry can respond and adapt and create those products and services, as well as improve the communications and transparency as well. So I think it's a combination of, of issues there. And, and within that, would you expect to see some sort of slightly different models emerging? We've got an interesting question here uh, from... Uh, Martin Pollard, who says, sort of given rising energy costs, what's your view on energy cooperatives that are building, directly building wind and solar farms, you know, sort of visible assets that they're, produ they're producing? You know, he says he's, he invests in a small share in a wind turbine. We've seen this kind of crowdfunding model starting to emerge. Um, Hilke, do you think that has a potential role to play here in just making it more visible, making it more community driven for people to, to move their money to, in, in line with their intentions? I mean, I just think that definitely does have a role to play. I think the really big part about if you think about pensions, you think about scale. Like we know that the majority of people's pensions are in the default fund. I, they don't really engage with it. They don't take active decisions on it. So we're at the point where either because they are not interested or they're not aware or they don't feel like they have sufficient sophistication to take the invest, investment decisions about their, their, um, their savings, people are not engaging even at that level, then going into saying like, okay, well, there's a community driven opportunity that seems like quite a leap. And there will definitely be people for whom the fact that it is community driven, that that impact piece is kind of clearly present might make it simpler. But I don't think, I do think, uh, I don't think that removes the hmm. financial literacy point and the fact that people are not engaging 
to start with, um, it seems like for, there will definitely be, be customers for whom that would be quite a leap yeah. um, to kind of say, well, actually, I'm, and, I'm going to invest directly. And, and this means that the default funds here are absolutely critical, are they not? If, if that's where the bulk of the, the, the game is at. I mean, do, uh, presumably we are, there, a lot of them are starting to talk about net zero, but if, if there's one thing we need to see progress on, it's them kind of choice editing, if you like, them getting out of the bad stuff and making it easier for people. Do you, do you think, are you encouraged we're going to start to see more of that or is there still a way to go? I am quite encouraged that we're, we're starting to see more of that. Um, there's... Uh, there's a huge amount of focus on climate risk from the regulator, regulators as well. So the majority of pensions are starting to think about like what's our climate risk and that is spurring, spurring conversations. They will be able to comment on the progress they've made on getting pension schemes to sign up to sign up to net zero. But that's the approach that we have taken mm. on our, our own defaults. So the idea that that is where the customer expects us to choose. And as long as we're making the right decisions, they get to go on a they get to go on the ride and as such for free. It's not an extra thing that they need to choose to do, mm. but we as the steward of their assets need to be taking the right long-term decisions. But I do think that there's also an element of, you know, for the one, for the customers who want to choose, providing more choice um, as well. So thinking about the areas where, you know, what kind of funds are you, are you making available? Um, we've just added a number of ESG funds into our um, range that uh, that pension default customers can choose should they wish to do so. So I think you need to kind of play to both bases. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, David, bring you in on that. I mean, is that part of kind of make my money matter strategy here? Is obviously you're consumer facing, you're getting that public engagement, but is an element of this to kind of just crank up that pressure so that eventually the default funds have to have to get with the program as well? Yeah, absolutely. And and we're really excited about the progress made in default funds. Yeah, since we launched 40 providers, the funds have made net, what we'd consider robust net zero targets, including a halving of emissions this decade. That's real progress in just 18 months since we kicked off. But what really matters now is moving from words into action and to accountability and to driving progress and for members to hold them to account. And that's why the member engagement point is so important, because it's not just about getting people to sign a petition or ask the pension funds to go net zero and then switch off. It's then about having those members as active agents of change within those pension funds, constantly asking the question, what progress have we made towards net zero? What investments have we made in climate solutions? Are we getting out of the worst polluters quickly enough? And so what we're trying to do is, is get those big macro targets secured and then to drive that progress and, and that change by mobilizing a whole generation of pension savers to use their voice to, to catalyze and speed up that impact within the funds. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just we've only got a couple, literally a minute left, but Hilka, I just wanted to pick up on one of your slides because I absolutely loved it. The, the idea of coal valuations being down 100% in 2050 and oil and gas down, I think it was something like 95, 94. Um, I've, I've never seen kind of the stranded asset risk framed in that way, but it, it was really resonant. I mean, can you, you did, did, I mean, do you use that slide a lot? Does that, does you try and get that to cut through with these pension funds to say, hang on a second, the stranded asset risks, if you don't get with the program here, are absolutely enormous. Well, I, that's exactly the, the point, and that's why um, the TCFD framework, the Task Force and Climate Related Financial Disclosures, really focuses on different scenarios. So obviously, in a world where we continue to burn coal, um, coal valuations might not go down, but um, we will suffer, suffer catastrophic climate change. So there is a trade-off, and part of bringing the, the point about climate risk and climate risk management home is understanding that in action, it's not just a trade-off, oh, if we act or if we exclude or start to do something, then that might, um, you know, that might cost us time, resource, potentially money. Um, there's also a cost of inaction. Um, and the reason that most people are starting to act now is that the cost is expected to be higher, not just financially, but also in terms of the quality of our lives and the future of um, of our societies. Yeah, indeed, indeed. A sobering point on which to end. But thank you so much for a fascinating conversation there uh, from Hilke and uh, David uh, from Ag um, Agon and uh, Make My Money Matter, respectively. And of course, a huge thank you to the team at Agon for their support of this event as one of our partners. Thank you both.